This morning we were talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And we were talking at, about it from Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And he says, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And we were talking about the power that we receive when we receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And we said that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it is a unique work from regeneration. Regeneration is when we confess our sins and confess our faith in Jesus Christ and the salvation that he provided on the cross. We are regenerated. We become a new creature, the Bible teaches. And then after, subsequent to that regeneration of, of being born again, becoming a new creature in Christ, then there is a unique subsequent work of the Holy Ghost coming upon us. And in the Bible, it's referred to as being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's referred to as the Holy Spirit falling upon us. It's referred to as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the main purpose for this is to provide us with spiritual power. And we saw a little bit this morning about how much we need that power. You have three enemies every day that are fighting against you to destroy you. Number one is your flesh. Number two is this world system that is around us. This world system that is around us, it's evil, it's degenerate, it's depraved, it's ugly, it's malicious. You don't believe it? Just study ISIS for a while. Just study the bad guys and you can see the wickedness that's in this world system. And it's no different. Our politicians and our government is just as corrupt. And it's going downhill fast. In fact, in fact, it's going to come to a place where the Bible says the only thing that will clean up this mess is fire. Just to purify and purge it with fire. And so uh, we have the world system that is our enemy every day. And then thirdly, we have the demonic host, Satan, the kingdom of darkness, that operates so proficiently that it is actually the governance over this world system. And... Uh, so we fight against those three enemies, the flesh, the world, and Satan, and every day they are battling for our souls. We will lose that battle if we don't have this power of the Holy Spirit. It's just that simple. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And this is where we're going to transition into tonight, where we said that we were going to take a look at each instance in the book of Acts where the Holy Spirit fell and people were filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Remember, they were in kind of this holding pattern. And Jesus had instructed them not to leave Jerusalem until they had been uh, clothed with power from on high, filled with the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine just being sitting here tonight and suddenly there's this huge, rushing, mighty wind? You know, we might liken it to a jet airplane or something taking off or landing since we're just so close to the airport and we hear them going overhead all the time. And just that, that sound of a mu rushing mighty wind. And can you imagine the walls starting to shake here and the Holy Spirit and the power of God starting to fill the house as we're sitting here. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each one of them. There appeared unto them cloven tongues. So these are tongues that have the appearance of being split in half, and they're forming fire on top of the heads of each one in this room. This is called the day of Pentecost. This is Pentecost. This is the birth of the church. This is the church uh, being filled with the power of God to do what it's commissioned to do by God. And it takes these cloven tongues referencing praying in the Holy Spirit, praying in other tongues. And we're not going to talk specifically about praying in other tongues tonight. I think we'll talk about uh, praying in other tongues and the gift of tongues next, next week. 
Next week we'll also talk about the other gifts of the Holy Spirit. But why does God give cloven tongues? Why do we pray in other tongues in a language that we don't understand with our mind? And we talked a little bit about that last week, about the fact that this is how we enter into that spiritual supernatural realm where our mind is disengaged. Because it's our mind that places limitations on God. And it's our mind that gets tripped up. And we need to, we need to exit our mind and enter into the realm of the supernatural where God can pray, the Holy Spirit can pray supernaturally through us the wisdom and the mysteries and the plan of God. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You know, as we, um, and we'll talk about this maybe a little bit tonight and probably more next week, but I think in, in decades prior to this, do you remember the times when people would pray over you to receive the Holy Spirit and they'd give you a few syllables to repeat and, you know, there's kind of like they were kind of trying to jumpstart the tongues, the praying in tongues. And, um, and I think all of that was very well intended and I think they were genuinely trying to help. I, I don't know if that's the best way to approach it myself personally. I know I, when I was filled with the Spirit, I was completely alone. I was a teenager just lying in my bed, in the dark at night, and I just began to pray, and I was baptized in the Holy Spirit all by myself. And I think for probably many of you, that's how it happened to you. It wasn't in a prayer line, necessarily. You were on your own, by yourself, and just praying and seeking Father, and the gift of tongues began to come, and you didn't understand what you were saying, but it was the Holy Spirit praying through you, the glories of God, the mysteries of God, speaking in that heavenly language. And it says here, as the Spirit gave them utterance. You know, when you're, when you're praying in the Spirit, there is a unique sense that your heart is praying, your spirit is praying, it's not your mind. And in English, you know, when you're speaking in English, your mind is at work, forming the words and forming the sentences. But when you pray in the Spirit, the mind is disengaged and the syllables, the actual words, are rising up out of your spirit by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives you the utterance. And so it's the Holy Spirit in your heart that forms the syllables and the words on your lips, and it's not your mind. Now, you know, and don't try to make that happen, and I think that's where uh, maybe people got frustrated in the past, because, you know, they, people would come up in a prayer line they would be prayed for to receive the Holy Spirit. And until you prayed in tongues, man, you weren't leaving that line. You know, you had to pray in tongues. And I don't think that's necessarily the right approach. I think, uh, I think we lay hands on you, we pray for you, and I think it's no different than regeneration. You pray and ask to be born again, and you walk away believing that you were born again. And I think we pray and we lay hands on you, and you ask the Lord to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit, and you walk away believing that you received the gift right then and there, whether you speak in tongues or not. And as you're praying and seeking Father, the Holy Spirit will guide you through the process of praying in tongues. And that's one of the greatest spiritual journeys and gifts that you will ever experience in your life, is working it out between you and the Holy Spirit and figuring out how it's done. As the Spirit gave them utterance. And you learn by practice that, that spiritual grace of God praying through you. And it says here, there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Remember, this was a time of year when the streets of Jerusalem were packed. And they were packed with many different nationalities, many different languages. And so these people were confounded because they heard these Galileans, obviously Jews, speaking in all of these foreign languages, proclaiming uh, the, 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 grace, the greatness of God. And they were confounded. Every man heard them speak in his own language. Now, when you and I pray in tongues or speak in tongues, we're not always going to be praying in another earthly language. Paul makes it clear that there are 
earthly languages, and then there are heavenly languages, spiritual languages. And so when you pray in other tongues in your prayer closet, you may be praying in a heavenly language, not an earthly language, but God did this special miracle here for a reason. But this is not necessarily the pattern for how it always works with you and me. Every man heard them speak in his own language. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians, Medes, dwellers in Mesopotamia, Judea, all these different places, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the what? The wonderful works of God. And so we see here, we get a glimpse, and we're going to study this more next week, but we get a glimpse into the purpose of speaking in tongues, declaring the wonderful works of God. How many of you have ever just been really, you know, overwhelmed by God's presence and God's greatness, and English just wasn't enough? You, you, you were praising Him and worshiping Him, but your language was not enough to express what was in your heart. And when you're praying and worshiping in tongues, that's what that's for. It kicks into that supernatural language where what's in your heart can be expressed. The gratitude, the wonder, the awe, the fear, the amazement. And you begin to speak and pray in tongues, and it really is a release of your spirit that goes far beyond the English language. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Others mocking said, all oh, these guys are just drunk, full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, you men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words, for these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, nine o'clock in the morning. I guess some people can get drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning, but uh, that's, that was uh, his reasoning here at the moment. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now you see here, this is a quote from Joel, the prophet Joel. And he did prophesy, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And some will prophesy, some will see visions, some will dream dreams. These uh, Our life, as you can see there, it's to be stamped with the supernatural. There's to be a supernatural element, a grace, an excellence to our life that can only be ascribed to the divine. It's beyond ourselves, it's beyond humanity. And that's what Father wants for you. He wants there to be something divine about your life, an excellence, a presence, a spirit that far surpasses anything here on earth. And that's what this pouring out of the spirit is all about. And as we mentioned last week in verse 18, he says, and my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out of my spirit. It's for everybody. You don't have to be good enough. You don't have to be cool enough. You don't have to be one of the pretty people. You don't have to be the in crowd. Even the servants and the handmaidens get filled with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter who you are. God wants to bless you with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he wants your life to be permanently marked with the impression of the supernatural, his divinity. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now you see here again what we were talking about this morning. This, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, being a unique work from regeneration. These had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They were born again. They were new creatures. They were regenerated. 
but they had not yet received the infilling, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. I think, um, I don't, I'm not sure about this, but I, may, I think maybe Thursday night, if anybody has not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we'll lay hands and pray for you Thursday night. But remember what we just talked about a moment ago, it, you don't have to receive it through the laying on of hands. We see that a number of times here in the scriptures. We're going to see uh, uh, an instance here in a moment where people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit just by listening to Bible teaching. You can receive it that way. You can receive it in, when you're all alone in the privacy of your own prayer life. But here, they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. And remember what we were just saying, it's just like being born again. You pray, you ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit, and you walk away believing that you have received it, whether you see any outward sign or not. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostle hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Now think about this for a moment. Something happened here. He laid hands on them, prayed, they received the Holy Ghost. There was something tangible that took place to where Simon said, hey, I want that. I'm willing to pay for it. And that's how, that's how tangible the Holy Spirit is when it comes into your life. That's how much of a change it makes in your heart, in your demeanor, in who you are. And when Simon saw it, he was willing to offer them money, and he said, give me also this what? This power. We don't know exactly what happened. Maybe nothing spectacular happened as far as spectacular to the physical senses, but something happened. They knew power was transferred. And when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, power is transferred. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Let me tell you something. Whatever Simon noticed, whatever Simon perceived or saw that day, you and I need it. We must have it to live victorious, holy lives in this crooked and perverse generation. Acts chapter 9, verse 17. This is right after Saul who we call most of the time Paul, was converted. And remember, he was converted on the road to Damascus. He was knocked off of his horse, had a great face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus Christ. And let's pick up the story here in verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, putting his hands on him. Now remember when he was knocked off the horse, what happened to him? He was blind. And he says to him, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest. So in that encounter with the Lord on the road, that's when Paul became regenerated, born again. That's when he encountered God. He hath sent me that thou might receive thy sight and to be what? To be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. And he received sight, and forthwith, and arose, and he was what? He was baptized. You know, I think as, you know, as I've been reading through these scriptures, I see the scriptures placing more, in an, more of an emphasis on the actual water baptism than I think we place on it many times. I, not that the act does anything spiritually, because it does not, but it, it seems to be very important throughout the book of Acts as a confirmation of the inward work of God, a confirmation of our faith, seems to play a vital role in all of these incidents. Acts chapter 10, verse 44, and this was what I was referring to just a moment ago. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. So here, hands weren't laid on them. They were just listening to the preaching of the word of God and in their heart, they were receiving the word of God. And in their heart, they were seeking and thirsting for God. And God blessed them with the Holy Spirit. It can happen just that simply. Just that easy. It's not hard to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's received by faith. 
God does the work. It's nothing that we generate or initiate. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and do what? Magnify God. You know, when we talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we'll talk about the fact that the gift of prophecy is most of the time God, the Holy Spirit, speaking to man, speaking to the believer. And the gift of tongues is speaking from man to God, magnifying God, giving Him worship, giving Him a supernatural praise that extends beyond the known language. And so there's a difference in flow. Prophecy being from God to man, tongues being from man to God in exaltation. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And so what is he saying here in verse 47? Verse 47 is very key to our understanding and doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he's saying here, Peter is saying, it's obvious that they're regenerated. It's obvious they've been born again because now they've been filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember we said the baptism of the Holy Spirit is unique from and subsequent to the new birth. And so Peter is saying here, it's obvious that they've been born again because they've been filled with the Spirit. So who can forbid water? Shouldn't they also be baptized in water as that confirmation of their faith? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of, of the Lord. Then prayed they hear him to tarry certain days. They didn't want him to take off right away. This is really interesting. The, the story of Apollos, Acts chapter 18, verse 24. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. I want you to notice these phrases here. Competent in the scriptures. He knew what he was talking about. He had a good grasp on theology and doctrine. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. Being in fervent in spirit, he spoke and he taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, but he was limited. All he knew was the baptism of John. So all he knew was the baptism of John. All he knew was repentance from sin. All he knew was the regeneration of being buried in Christ and raised as a new creature. And of those things, he spoke very accurately. Of those things, he was very confident, and he knew what he was saying. And so he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God, what? More accurately. See, there, he was missing some pieces. There was more he needed to understand. He understood the baptism in water very clearly. He understood regeneration and being raised up as a new creature very clearly. And he expounded and taught those things very competently. But he was missing some. And what he was missing was the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And when he wished to cross to Acacia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he helped greatly those who through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by scriptures that Christ was Jesus. Now watch what happens in the very next chapter. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? You've believed, you've been regenerated, but now there's a subsequent work to receive. There's more to receive. There's the power of the Holy Spirit. And they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there be a Holy Ghost. We, didn't, we don't know what you're talking about. We haven't heard of this. And he said unto them, then unto what then were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. The baptism of repentance, the baptism of regeneration, the baptism of the new birth. Then said Paul, 
John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues, and they also did what? They prophesied. And we'll talk about this more next week once again. But you know, and this kind of goes along with what I was saying before. In the past, there's been some practice that until, unless people heard you speak in tongues, they would tell you you haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit. And I don't, I don't buy that. I, I don't see that anywhere in Scripture. And I don't think we can make assertive, declarative statements like that unless the, the Scripture says that in a declarative, assertive way. Uh, what we have here are examples, real-life examples, and principles and precedents. And... When the Holy Ghost came on this batch here, it says, and all the men were about 12. That's a, we have a, just about 12 in this room, so it was about a, a group this size. You know, It's very possible that some spoke in tongues and some didn't speak in tongues, but some prophesied. And so the Holy Spirit manifested, the filling of the Holy Spirit manifested in different ways upon different people. Now again, next week we'll get into this more, but I do believe that uh, the prayer language of tongues is for every believer. But I do not believe that as we're praying for you to receive the Holy Spirit, I believe once we pray for the Holy Spirit to be given to you and you receive it in faith, you have it. Uh, the tongues, they may come immediately. They may come a day later, a week later, a year later. They may come when you're privately in your prayer closet between you and Father and you finally get that connection going and, um, and things begin to work for you and you figure it out between you and the Holy Spirit. But uh, the, the filling of the Holy Spirit can manifest in your life in so many different ways. And I think we need to approach it with the same faith as we approach the new birth. I pray for it and I receive it in faith in Jesus' name. And so we see how they, they received it here. And that's it. That's the last passage, huh? Any questions on anything that we've talked about? Any questions on anything that I've said? You know, I know there's been a lot of variations through the years. I like to be very careful. I don't like to make statements that the scriptures don't make. And uh, like the new birth, I believe the baptism in the Holy Spirit is a very personal thing between you and Father. And I believe it's going to manifest itself in your life not by any cookie cutter pattern, but it's going to be something beautiful and wonderful that the Holy Spirit works out in your life. And so next week we'll, we'll progress and we'll talk more about praying in tongues, the gift of tongues, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit.